Well, good morning. It's great to see you. It's Friday. We've got a lot to pray about. We've got a lot of military men and women being activated around the world and being uh, on call due to the situation that we've got going on in Afghanistan. So we're praying for all of our men and women that are there. Uh, we're pr praying for our policemen, our firefighters, and our first responder because when we have these kinds of things going on on the national scene, uh, it lets these little terror groups and even domestic terrorism kind of pop up and do some things. So Let's be thinking about the image Friday. So we hope you've had a great week. We hope you're getting ready to take a couple of days off and, and get re-energized here in the things of God because it's all that's going to matter in the end. And the more we look at the craziness of the world, the sooner we can see Jesus coming back and taking us out of here. And, you know, I don't want to be the one that sits here and tries to scare you, but I just want you to be prepared for the fact um, that all this stuff that we're seeing is all lined right out with the Bible. So good to see you, Karen Midkiff. I hope everything is going well with you today. And uh, I jumped up ready to go this morning. And uh, one of the things I like to do in some of my spare time is teach school. And I was going to go teach second grade today. But uh, I realized I had another appointment and I can't do that. So um Still got to get out of here at our normal time at 7.30, but, uh, you know, if you've ever had an opportunity and not taken it or if you've ever wanted to, you know, the school system is really need substitute school teachers right now. And, um, you know, I think depending on what state you live in, there's different things. So um, I was going to get second grade today if I'd have been able to go, and I hate that because people were dependent on me. But I had another appointment and, you know, it was just so far out, you know, how things go sometimes on appointments. And then I saw it and I'm like, man, I got to go to that. I can't cancel it. So that's where we're at. So we're going to finish up uh, discussing the book of Deuteronomy and nowhere, you know, I don't want you to think for one single second that you and I have really covered anything uh, in these first five books. We've just hit the very high notes at the, at the least because there's a bunch and bunch of history in here. And especially if you're a Jewish person, you know, all your history starts uh, from the time of Abraham and, and leads right up till present day. So you're in this Bible all the way through. How are you and I as uh, Gentiles uh, in this deal? We got grafted in because Jesus came, took the message to the Jewish people. They would not receive the message. So in uh, John chapter 1, verse 12, Jesus says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him unto them, gave he the power to become the sons of God. So you and I, by accepting Jesus, have become a son of God, a joint heir with Jesus, an ambassador for Jesus Christ. So an ambassador is me going forth and proclaiming the good things about Jesus. So that's where we're at today. So we're coming down to the end of Moses' life. Moses is, is, is supposed to have lived around 120 years. He had 40 years uh, as probably, I don't know, heir apparent to Pharaoh in Egypt. Then he kills the Egyptian and he has to flee. He spends 40 years uh, in the wilderness. So the first 40 years, uh, Pharaoh is teaching him how to run an army, right? Why is that going to be important? Because he's going to take 2 million people out of Egypt. So the second 40 years is God getting him ready out in the wilderness and Moses has no idea. God's working with him out in that wilderness. Then God comes to the burning bush and says, go back to Egypt. Moses says, hey, I don't think I should go back there because I think they want to kill me. And, Moses, and God says, all the people that um, sought thy life are now dead. So he jumps in and he goes back and God doesn't make it easy on Moses, right? And he doesn't make it easy on the people because, you know, when God gives out a plague, Pharaoh counters it with make stones uh, with no straw or make bricks with no straw, which was a very hard thing to do. So with all those things said, now we get here and we find out, you know, we got one more problem after another. But now these folks have been together for what would have been now 40 years. Okay. So they've been together 40 years. Moses is going to be called to the house or going to be called to heaven. And they're going to leadership and it's just some of the amazing things that are happening there. Um, our policemen, firefighters, and first responders in these cities. And then to make, you know, the icing on top of all that crappy cake is the fact that we've got this COVID thing coming back around. And, um, 
you know, the people that are working on the front lines, the doctors and the nurses that are watching these people in these hospitals heaving and, and just ruining their health and young people, you know. So before you jump in there and say COVID's not real, you better pay attention to the, uh, to the fact that it is. And, you know, you can be for or against the vaccine if you want, but, you know, you've had the vaccine before you were ever, ever allowed to go to school. And it started when we were kids, you know, there were several vaccines we had to have. And, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know. It just, it's just the devil's just twisting and twisting things. So let's go with what we've got to go with. And what we're into today is out of the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Very interesting um, that it's this early in the Bible, but it should be in every household. And what it talks about is how parents are to get with their children and, and remind their children of what this thing's all about. Now, in this day and time, this was the Jewish people, where the Israelites were to get together with their children, tell them about the heritage of the Jewish people, tell them how they came from a Abram, tell them all these other things that are going on. So the Lord told me, Moses said, to teach you these things and give you these rules. So now if you obey these things, God's going to bless you. So... There's no other God. Remember the Ten Commandments. So you worship me and only me. And Moses says you need to memorize these laws. Now, do you remember how many laws there were? 600 and something. So would it be a little bit difficult to memorize 600 laws? Well, it probably was. But look here. If you had to memorize, can you imagine how good that you would do at something if you took the time to memorize it? Because when I was going to school, they had this thing going, oh, don't memorize something. Well, I mean, that's the easiest, quickest way to do anything, really, is just to memorize the steps or, or, or the program or, you know, the class, whatever you're doing. So I, I've always kind of thought that's, that's very interesting. Um, but Moses says, memorize the law and tell them to your children. See, as parents, one of the places you and I failed today is once our kids get busy and they grow up a little bit and they kind of get their own thing. And mine's getting there pretty quick. She's 16 now. She's able to drive on her own so she can take off and go about anywhere she wants. And she has no fear of doing that either. So there's some good in that, but there's some bad in that because she's still going to live in this house for another two or three years, even if she goes away to college. So when she does all this stuff, I need to, to still be teaching her, right? And, uh, and I hope... That, that we've done a good enough job to plant enough seeds to let her know it's real. And I believe that she knows God's real. And I believe that, you know, she thanks God for the blessings because, you know, I mean, I, you know, I remind her a lot that you have a lot of things that most people don't have. And it all comes from God. Whether we got one thing or 10,000 things, it's all from God. And, and what we're learning here and what we're reading is, if God doesn't get the praise for what you do have in life, guess what he might do? He may just take it all away. And the other big thing is, is maybe he doesn't take away the things or maybe we don't know because you and I are going through life living in a gray area. And then one day we die and find out we weren't saved at all. So we got to really be careful with these things and make sure that we know that we know we're saved and we can know that. Right? There's no, it's whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So you say, well, I'm covered by that. And you are covered. But then you got to also remember the devil believes and he trembles, but he's not going to heaven. So what's the difference? So work on your relationship with the Lord. Get closer, right? And share the messages with your kids, right? Work with your children. Talk to them. Tell them about this thing called the Bible. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them why church is important. You know, I mean, it just there's so many reasons why. And, and then when I look around at society right now and all the issues and problems on all sides, it's really simple to see that God's got a master plan, right? And because of God's master plan, he wants you to do the best that you can do. And the best that you can do is to get into this relationship with Jesus Christ. Because that's going to last for all eternity. And these other things, I mean, i got to be honest, there's things that I just don't know how they're going to last just because of the way that society's tilting. And it's such a sadness because society, 
I don't know, man. I just, I look and I'm just like, is that really happening? Could it really be that bad? Could we really have been so short-sighted on something? And Afghanistan's one of those things, you know? You left all that technology, left all that equipment, but above all those assets that you left, you left the people. And uh, once again, I'm not going to beat on the political thing, um, you know, because I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat. Right now, you ought to be scared to death of the leadership in this country. And, uh, you know, there you go. So uh, by the time we get over to Deuteronomy chapter 29, it's been 40 years after God has made this covenant with Israel. And so Moses is reminding them of something else. He said, look, the Lord has made an agreement with you. And he says, if you keep your part of the agreement, you will be successful in everything that you do. Have you met some really successful people in your life and then found out that they were Jewish people? See, where did that promise come from? It came from right here. Well, they weren't, they were ruthless and they were mean and, you know, whatever. Listen, God blessed that group of people, okay? Now, are there some poor Israelites? Absolutely. There are poor, suffering Jewish people around the world? Absolutely, okay? But there's also some that have changed the world with their inventions, some that have changed the world with their business, and, and some guys blessed, you know, beyond. But the thing that they got to be careful is if they don't have Jesus and they leave this world, see, they're going to have missed it all. So we have to be careful in some of our things because we don't want to be, we want to bless Israel so Israel will bless us. But at the same time, we don't want to end up worshiping Israel because God blessed them. See, our, our blessing will come directly from God. So think about those things. So this contract isn't just for the assembled generation any more than the contract at Mount Sinai was for the previous generation. It is for all the descendants. So not only you are going to get a blessing if you were an Israelite, but you threw down through all your generations. And that's a little bit of what I had just said about that. So now Moses is 120 years old. Moses does not get to go into a promised land, but he gets to go to the top of the mountain, okay, at Mount Nebo. <clears throat> and this uh, Mount Nebo rises above the rich Jordan River Valley in Jericho, which was the oasis or the city of Palms. At the summit, Moses sees the land of promise, and then he dies. Now, it also goes on to tell us that Moses is in an unmarked grave, and I told you a little bit about why that's so. It, and the reason for that is that Moses, okay, <clears throat> is going to need that body because at some point Moses, and we believe it was probably Elijah, will be preaching during this tribulation period, right? There are two witnesses that are ultimately killed again, or Moses will be killed for the second time. Elijah is a symbol of somebody who has never seen death. So it'll be Elijah's first death. But that's symbolic of the dead in Christ will rise first, people like Moses that have died. But those that are walking around at the time the church is raptured out of here are symbolic of Elijah who will not see death. So is it possible for you not to see this physical death that most of us are going to see? It's absolutely possible if you're alive and walking around during this period of time. So let's just look at a little bit of a review and uh, like I said, I got to get rolling here. I've got an appointment that I didn't even realize I had. Um, so I got to roll out of here myself. So Moses told the Israelites that the hills of the promised land are filled with iron, ore, and copper. Now, this is interesting, okay, because God gives you valuable things, okay? So Moses told them that these hills were filled with iron, ore, and copper. The mountains east of the Sea of Galilee contained iron. The rugged territory south of the Dead Sea had rich deposits of both iron and copper. Some of the copper mines in the area date to before the time Israel had kings starting about 1000 BC and were reopened with the Romans uh, when the Romans arrived. So copper mining was only recently abandoned there. So now I want you to think about this. God gave them an area that had rich, fertile valleys for growing, right? But then he gave them all the iron and all the metal works that they needed, and, you know, here it is. So think about these things. And then, um, 
you know, I'm not going to get into what scholars say. The book was not written by Moses and all that stuff. Look, God is big enough to put this Bible together and hold it together for several thousand years. You know, if somebody says Moses wrote the book of Deuteronomy, he wrote it. If he had Joshua write it, whatever. But ultimately, the hand of God is the one, you know, that or the Holy Spirit of God is the one that inspired him to write down what they wrote down. And that's why that this thing becomes uh, important. And this is how it's important, right? Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, let's see, to see an elderly Joshua follow uh, Moses' example of a farewell address and a covenant, read Joshua. So we're going to get into Joshua the next time. Um, in fact, you know, we might just talk about that a little bit. We've got a little bit of time. I kind of ran through Deuteronomy because, you know, you've, you've had Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then Deuteronomy. So there's four books that detail that time frame, and they all have their own stories to tell, right? But now uh, Moses is handing things over to Joshua. Joshua's an interesting person because Joshua and Caleb are the only two that were grown up at the time uh, of the Exodus that actually get to enter into um, the promised land. So that's kind of interesting. So why is that so? Well, they believed in God's promises and they came back and said, hey, the land's good. Let's go down there and follow God and let God lead us through there and take this place. Well, the other 10 spies, as you recall, they came back and they said, hold on a second, we're not interested in that because they've got giants down there. Well, they didn't have giants, right? But what, what was it? They didn't want to be bothered with the aggravation of doing the things God wanted them to be doing. I'm going to raise my hand. I'm very guilty of that a lot of times of not doing the things God wants me to be doing. Why am I like that? Well, I'm lazy. Yeah, you know, I feel like I've done my work this week. I'm not going to do anything else, you know. And, and you know, I go through bouts of, of that kind of thing. You know, then sometimes, you know, I'm on fire. I'm out here trying to do stuff. So we've all got to find our little thing to do for the Lord. So here's Joshua, who's getting ready to take over. And about 1,400 years before Jesus comes on the scene, Joshua starts the conquest that God has laid out in this land of Canaan, which is the land of milk and honey. So God has made a 700 year promise to an old man with no kids. <laughs> How about that? So think about that. That's Abraham, wasn't it? Abraham didn't have any kids. He made that big promise. And there you go. He says, go to the land that I will show you. And Abraham was 75 years old when this happened. And he says, I'll bless you and I'll make your descendants into a great nation. Now, this is Genesis chapter 12, if you want to go back and, and you want to read it. So Abraham did obey and he arrived near the center of Canaan, which is now Israel. God said, look around to the north, the south, the east, and the west, and I will give you and your family all the land that you see, and it will be yours forever. Now, once again, let me take you to today's headlines in the newspaper. Why are they fighting in Israel? Why are they fighting in the Middle East? It's all got to do with this land and the promises of God. And the fighting that's going against the real God is the devil and his agents or his demons. Okay, so that's what's going on. So Abram has a grandson, Jacob. Okay, Jacob leads his the tribe of, of the Israelites into Egypt to escape the famine. We remember that when we talked about it in the book of Joseph. Well, Joseph, who was thought to be dead, is now number two man in Egypt. Why? Because God put him in that position. So under God's order, you know, uh, or not God's order, but God's favor, I guess you would say, Joseph gets to be the number two man in Egypt, saves the people from the famine. So it was a picture for you and I to see Sometimes God's working in our life and we're like, man, God, you're killing me. Why are you doing this? What is going on? And then he brings you through on the other side and you do what Joseph did when he revealed to his brothers that he was Joseph. He said, what you all meant for evil, God used it to accomplish good. And see, that's what we've got to understand. Whatever's going on in our life, as long as we're with the Lord, see, we're always going to be with the Lord. And God may be using my illness, maybe God's using 
you know, whatever's going on in my life. And if I praise the Lord through it, there's going to be a blessing in this. Am I guaranteed I'm going to get something on this earth? Not guaranteed that. But there'll be a blessing in heaven because God is trying to grow you to be faithful over a few things so he can make you ruler over many. Now, that's interesting for me to say, considering we've just read where God told him or Moses told them that if they'll be faithful and obedient to God, God's going to make them successful in everything they do. I have a hard time putting that in there because I don't want you to think if you haven't received or, or been as successful in life as you think you should have been, right? I don't want you to think that you've, that you've suffered in this way. Does that make sense? Because here's the ultimate thing. What I've realized at age 54 is it doesn't matter how much money I make, I take just as much as a multimillionaire to heaven when I die. Just like I came into this world with nothing, I'm going to leave out of here with nothing. So what do I really have? Well, I've got some friends in this world, right? But the thing is, the number one thing for me is to tell people how to get to Jesus because that's all they're going to care about is getting to heaven because if they wake up in hell, they're going to be saying, Lunsford, what? Because see, remember in Luke 16, 19, how they could see across the great gulf? So they're going to be able to see people in heaven. So people are going to see Lunsford and say, why didn't Lunsford ever tell me about Jesus? So that's why I love Facebook Live, not because I'm so pretty to look at in the morning, but because everybody on my friends list, they'll never be able to come up to me and say, Lunsford, why didn't you tell us about Jesus? Stephanie Barker, why didn't you tell me about Jesus? Stephanie shares this program every morning. All your friends, folks, they see this on your, on your wall or whatever you want to call it. So they can come, you know. And the problem with society today is they just are not interested. So we got to be careful because we could get negative. We could get, uh, you know, we could get to the point where we say, well, we're just not interested anymore. You know, I'm just not going to fall full with it because nobody cares. Nobody's doing anything, blah, blah, blah. But it's not my job to save you. My job is to tell you the information and then you decide. And that's what all of our jobs are. I, none of us can save anybody. So that's kind of where we're at. So we're kind of recapping this thing as we get into the, li the, the life or the book of Joshua. So Joshua's about ready to lead them in. Uh, under God's control, of course, Moses frees the uh, children from the bondage of Pharaoh. Now they're under God's control again. Joshua is going to do the things God's asking him to do by leading. And now Joshua is going to take them home into the promised land that was promised all the way back in Genesis chapter 12 to Abraham. So there's many scenes in this story uh, are as dramatic as those of the great Exodus. The water of the Jordan River stops flowing so the Israelites can enter the promised land. The walls of Jericho spontaneously collapse before Joshua's army. The sun and the moon stand still so Joshua's soldiers can finish an important battle. The narrative makes it clear that the conquest of Canaan had little to do with Joseph's or Joshua's military savvy or the bravery of the Israelite people. So let this be a lesson to us. God went before these folks when they did what he wanted them to do and he led them in battle and they were victorious. And what the writer's saying here, see, these are just notes. This is not the King James Bible. But what he's saying, it wasn't anything to do with how smart Joshua was, and it wasn't anything to do with the bravery of Israel. It was the fact that God himself went in front of this army <clears throat> and won these battles for these people. And, he, and, and the way they laid these things out should tell us, you know, why, how is this happening? March around the city of Jericho seven times, and it was tap a drum or beat something and the walls come tumbling down. We've heard that song our whole life, right? How about this? Did you ever hear that the sun and the moon stood still so that the, they would blind the enemies and make it easier for Joshua to fight? So what is it saying? It's saying that uh, God had a hand in this, but he still used people. See, sometimes we're out here saying, God, why don't you do this and why don't you do that? But God always uses people in whatever he's doing. Now, he didn't use people here to stop the moon and the stars, and he didn't use people to stop the river from running so they could cross the river, right? 
That's purely God. But the people still had to do the crossing. You see, I think what our thing is, we want God to pick us up, carry us through the situation, sit us down on the other side of the river and say, now, what else do you need me to do for you? When it's not that kind of a relationship, okay? It's the relationship that God says, if you will do this, then I'm going to do that. And here's what your part was to do. I'm going to stop the river, but you still have to cross it, right? I'm going to blind the enemy by putting the sun at your back. So they're fighting into the sun, but you still got to do the fighting. See, see, there's a part that each of us have to play in the things of the Lord. And that's our biggest problem today, man, is we just think that God's let us down in our country. God's let us down in our, in our state. God's let us down in our little towns with the drug epidemic and all this stuff that's going on. But it's not that God let us down. We had a part to play in all this, and we just didn't play the part. And that's why we're struggling like we are. Now, granted, the sin nature that entered into the world in Genesis 3 has been the sin nature that we've all inherited, so we've all had to fight that. But we live today in, in, a, in an amazing time, okay? And we could turn back to the Lord. We could see our nation healed, but we've got to get rid of the corruption. And the corruption is at the highest levels with the people with the most power. So it's highly unlikely that it's going to happen. Uh, the big verse out of Joshua 24, 15, as Joshua says, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. As for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. So that's where we're at today. Who are you going to serve? You're going to serve somebody. Oh, no, not me. I'm going to get with Jesus when I get my life lined out. You're never going to get that life lined out. You need the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you because that's what's going to make all the difference in the world. So I hope and I pray that you got something out of these studies the last couple of weeks. Now, Joshua will be a little different because these books will kind of change. I mean, there's a first Kings and a second Kings, right? First Chronicles and a second Chronicles. Terry, it's my pleasure to be on here with you guys. And to me, this is church because the Bible tells me where two or three of us are gathered together in the name of the Lord, he'll be in the midst. This is no different than us being in a church with 30,000 people this morning. So it helps us get our day started, helps us get where we need to be. So we've seen the first five books of the Bible. Now we're coming into the life of Joshua. There's a lot of battles. Now I want to you know, when we get into this next week, you're going to see some things. And one of the things that you're going to see is the fact that God, when he told him to go in and take something, he would say something like, kill every man, woman, child, and even their animals. And you say, oh my gracious, that's such, you know, you know, there's no way we could do that. Well, you do what God commands you to do. And one of our problems today in society is we don't enforce the law. Right, And because we don't enforce the law, people don't realize that there's a good and a bad and there's got to be punishment for the sins. So people just continuously push the envelope on things. And it's the same thing with our presence in the world based on this Afghanistan thing. We've really put our military men and women in harm's way all over the world because now we've shown that we don't know what we're doing. So please pray for our military. They're at the top of our list. Please pray. Please pray. Pre <laughs> Please pray for our policemen, our firefighters, and our first responders. These folks are dealing with the same kind of craziness because we're not enforcing the law in this country anymore. And it's all in the direction of Satan. Is Satan a Democrat? Is Satan a Republican? Look, it's the world system, okay? It's the system of corruption. It's the system of getting people into positions that they have no business being in, right? Right? And how does that happen? Well, it just happens because if you got the money or the power, or you're willing to do certain things, you're going to be able to run over certain people and now you're going to get what we've got. So the only way to get back to where we need to get to is to pray about it. Because God tells us if we live by the sword, we're going to die by the sword. So if I take my guns to town, guess what's going to happen? Somebody's going to shoot me or somebody's going to put me in prison. Now, may that happen to us Christians? It may. I don't know, but the problem, the probably what's going to happen is the church will be raptured out of here and it may happen any time. It may not happen in my lifetime, but that don't change the promise of God. 
So our job is to be ready every single day to meet the Lord. And then at our appointed time when we meet him, it don't matter. If it's 50 years to, from today, it doesn't matter if he comes like a thief in the night tonight and takes us all out of here. So be ready. All right, I got to close out and you guys have a wonderful weekend. Lord, we're thankful for what you've given us in this Bible. We can see how you blessed Israel and you tell us that if we bless Israel, you will bless us. And if we don't bless them, we're in for a big bunch of trouble. And I'm worried that that may be the next thing after this Afghanistan fiasco is countries like Iran, um, you know, get bolder toward our, our biggest ally, which is, which is Israel. So Lord, protect them. We ask you also to protect our men and women military who have been put in harm's way, not only in Afghanistan, but all over the world by the weak leadership that we have shown. We also want you to be with our policemen, our firefighters, and our first responder, responders that are fighting these domestic battles in these cities, from the riots, from the drug epidemics, to the fact that they'll arrest somebody and put them in jail, and, and somebody's out of jail and home before the police get the paperwork done. Folks, that's not sending the right answer right there. Or the, you know, that's not the right way to, to, to put out the judgment on that. So there it is. Our hospitals, again, are being overrun with COVID, and these uh, doctors and nurses and uh, staffs at these hospitals are horrified by what you're seeing. So please stay safe for all those that are listening. And Lord, we'd ask you, please take this COVID out of here. We've seen a little taste of it. We've seen how it works on the mind, right, as well as the body. If you've got it or if you don't have it, there is a mental sickness here that's going on because people are depressed over it. People are torn apart over it. But brothers against brothers and husbands against wife over what should be done and shouldn't be done. And, and it's just getting crazier by the day. So, Lord, we know you're in complete control. We ask you to just... Get that last person saved. Show us that last person. Let's talk to them. Let's tell them about you. Convict that heart. Get them saved. Take the church out of here. So shall we ever be with you after that moment in time. So again, Lord, forgive us where we fail you. Help us to pray, give you the praise for every single thing we have from our breath of life to our food, shelter, and our clothing and for our eternal life that you've promised us if we believe in you. So again, forgive us where we fail you. Lead us, direct us, and guide our paths. We will praise you to the day we see you face to face. And at that moment, we will cast the crowns that we've earned at your feet and praise you for all eternity. We praise you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, folks. <clears throat> <You know, clears throat> you're right, Myrtle. I mean, I hate to get political, but I mean, I can't help what the truth is on things. And, uh, you know, you're just seeing it. <clears throat> people people are swayed. People won't read the newspaper. People won't do the right thing. You know, they won't educate themselves. And we just got a disaster going right now. So let's pray that God intervenes because he's the one that can. He's the one. He's getting ready to go in front of Joshua in these battles we're going to encounter next week. So guess what? God can go in front of the United States again if we let him come back. So that's what I'm praying for, and I hope that it works out for us. You guys have a wonderful weekend.